Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Gilda Hilaire, and I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager leading Marketing Cloud Trailblazer Activities. Today, we are presenting the technical aspects of deliverability presented by Al I Iverson, Director of Deliverability, along with Salesforce MVPs and Marketing Champions, Zuzana, Jason, and Corinna. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will try to address these during the presentation and at the end. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Al Iverson. Thank you, Gilda. Hi, everybody. Al Iverson here. Uh, as Gilda said, I'm Director of Deliverability for Marketing Cloud. And what that means is uh, me and the uh, team of smart folks on my team consult directly with clients every day to help address ISP deliverability and technical email challenges. So that's what I want to talk about today, some of those technical challenges. Um, I consider this sort of a sort of a 201 level class um, on deliverability, thinking of 101 as your deliverability basics as far as what is reputation and all those fancy things. Um, and uh, this is a follow-up to uh, that periodic Deliverability 101 session that we do. Um, and today I'm going to focus on uh, domain uh, configuration, IP address configuration, strategy for both, email authentication, what it is and how it works, um, and a whole bunch of other technical related stuff that is uh, both general to deliverability and specific to Salesforce Marketing Cloud. So I got a bunch of stuff here, so I'm going to dive right in. Um, so let's start with, uh, at, a, at a high level, at an easy level, what is email authentication? Um, email authentication proves that mail purporting to be from you really came from you. Um, it lets Bob.com signal, send an identifier that proves that mail that purports to be from Bob.com is actually from Bob.com. Um, and this is important because there's a lot of bad guys out there who, who spoof and fish, right? They send fake mail or they try to trick people into clicking on bad links and downloading bad stuff or giving up personal information. So it's very important in the realm of ISPs to be able to tell good mail from bad mail uh, based on, for example, this stable, uh, stable identifier that's attached to an email message by way of email authentication. This is also very important for deliverability and reputation. If you're gonna try to measure a client, uh, a sender, to see how good are they, to see whether or not they're mail warrants inbox delivery, or if perhaps it doesn't, it should go to the spam folder, or maybe even be blocked. Um, you need to be able to stably identify that sender so that you're not, you, you know you're identifying the right person. And in this instance, uh, email authentication is also very helpful because it helps prevent sort of fake mail being counted against you. If you authenticate all your mail properly, there's bad guys in Russia or Korea or China trying to send mail as you, they're not able to do so as, success, as successfully as they were able to do so before email authentication came about. Um, and so what are these technologies involved in email authentication? First one there is SPF, that's Sender Policy Framework. That's a simple text record that goes in DNS um, that just contains a list of IP addresses. And it says these IP addresses are allowed to send mail on behalf of my domain. So if Bob.com publishes an SPF record that includes the IP addresses of the mail servers that Bob.com uses, any mail that comes out of those servers, ISPs will check that SPF record. They'll say, oh, good, this um, truly came from an IP address under Bob.com's control. It truly really is from Bob.com. Um, it's very easy to set up, um, but it's not. Uh, it doesn't cover all possible types of email use cases. It doesn't survive email forwarding, for example. So if if you um, have a university alumni account and you receive email there and you forward it to somewhere else like a Gmail or a Yahoo uh, account. Um, that's an example of that forwarding use case, handing it off from one ISP to another um, interferes with this SPF authentication. So looking at that and figuring out what else you can do to authenticate email messages to survive those kind of use cases and uh, be more sort of robust overall, that leads us to DKIM, Domain Keys Identified Mail. Um, and what that does is it applies a cryptographic signature. You don't see it, it's in a hidden header, um, but it, that signature is a sort of a checksum, a calculation that says, hey, this message really came from Bob.com and it hasn't been modified in transit. 
Nobody's messed with it. Nobody's modified anything in there. So it truly is from bob.com. It's not based off of IP addresses. It's based off of domain names. Um, the, the only downside to it is really that it can be a little trickier for people to set up. Um, it involves a little bit more knowledge of DNS. Um, you've got to paste what's called a public key in, into the DNS record. Um, and some DNS tools are a little too basic and don't really understand how DKIM works. And so there, there are some kinds of DKIM records that won't fit in that, that DNS record. So that's, that's, um, that's one of the challenges that people run into sometimes when they're trying to set up DKIM. The next layer on top of the layer of sort of SPF and DKIM being the authentication layer, then you have this DMARC layer on top of this, which is sort of like a policy layer. Um, and what DMARC does is it lets domain owners publish a policy to tell the world um, what to do with mail that is supposedly from me, but doesn't pass any checks to prove that it really came from me. So what this does is it kills phishing and spoofing uh, almost dead. It makes it very hard for a bad guy to successfully spoof your domain name. Um, and that's a really good thing. Um, and, and that it's you know, any, anybody, whether they're in, in financial services or retail or any sort of big knowledgeable brand, even a small brand, right? You don't want people out there to be able to successfully pretend to send messages to you and have that mail get delivered and trick people or offend people. You know, you don't want people to get mad about your domain name over mail you didn't actually send and you didn't have any say in. So that's where DMARC comes into play. It's very important for that. The downside is that it's even trickier to set up and that if you do it wrong and you don't properly authenticate all the legitimate mail that's being sent, you could be telling ISPs to throw away or block some percentage of your legitimate mail. Um, so that's not a good thing. So that's why it's sort of an expert level option that um, you have to be really careful when you set up DMARC that you are aware of and have fully set up authentication for all of the different mail streams out there that use your email domain name. And that's basically everything I just said there because I timed that transition poorly. There's DMARC in a nutshell. Hey, a housekeeping note, we're gonna give everybody, um, uh, tomorrow we're gonna send a follow-up email to the recording of this as well as a PDF copy of all of this. So you'll have something that's searchable, all the links are clickable and so forth. So you certainly don't need to take notes here. All of this stuff will be available and you'll be able to copy and paste and click on stuff. Um, there's a couple other email authentication technologies that you might hear about um, that are really no longer in use, but you might still run into them once in a while if you find an old support guide uh, or an old blog post or a domain that was set up 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Um, that's domain keys and sender ID. Uh, domain keys is sort of the first version of what is now called DKIM, D-K-I-M, a domain keys identified mail. Um, it was, that was, gen it was uh, invented, created by Yahoo, used only by them. Um, and uh, that's, it, I, I think they still technically support it, but um, it's really been fully supplanted by DKIM. Uh, next is sender ID, which is a Microsoft specific version of that sender policy framework. So it's a DNS record that, that you put IP addresses in, and that is how uh, Microsoft uh, Hotmail and related properties would, properties would have authenticated that mail came from you years ago. Uh, they don't do that today. Today they rely on SPF and DKIM like everybody else. So again, if you run into these, uh, they're essentially harmless, uh, but they're not best practice. Don't waste your time setting them up. Definitely scratch them out of any guides you might have that still mention them. Um, here is another thing that is sort of authentication related and that is that people ask a lot about it in the same breath. And it, it it's another layer that goes on top of email authentication to make it work. Um, it's BME, it's brand indicators for message identification. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Um, what Beamy is, is it's a, a sender logo, sort of a brand avatar, if you will. Um, it lets you put um, a logo next to your email messages. It's uh, the intent there is to have it show up in on mobile or in the web UI of applications like Gmail and, and Hotmail and um, Yahoo. Um, and in fact, Yahoo is the only one who has uh, support for it right now. Um, if you want to implement it, you should implement it. It can't hurt. It's good to have a little logo, but keep in mind that it's only implemented at Yahoo and Yahoo's support is very basic and in beta at this time. So there are some cases where it won't work or you don't send enough volume and they don't clarify what enough means. Um, and so don't hang your hat on this magically working everywhere. 
you'll see uh, Gmail has announced support for it, but they, they're not live yet. Uh, Microsoft hasn't announced anything about this at all. They have a competing thing called brand cards, uh, but that seems to have died. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm not really sure what's happening at Microsoft as far as logos. I imagine they'll jump on the Beamy bandwagon, if you will, at some point, but today there's nothing there. Um, so that was an overview, a very high level overview of these different email authentication technologies. Um, let's translate some of that into how it works in Marketing Cloud, what the features and functionality are <coughs> relating to domains as a starting point. Start with sender authentication package. Um, sender authentication package is a branding tool. Uh, it maps your domain name over all the places where a domain name is going to show in email messages that are sent out of our platform. I'm going to jump ahead here. So if you, if you send and you don't have it in place, you're going to see all these different places where it's going to say exacttarget.com or exct.net. <coughs> Excuse me, not branded as you, not branded as the client at all. When you have SAP in place, it maps the domain name to all these different places, right? In this example, I've got em.ntodemo.com. That's my domain name. And you can see all the different places that it shows up. It's also being used for email authentication, right? So it's going to authenticate that email message with DKIM and SPF authentication with both of those. Here you can see that kind of thing in the header, right? So this is when you do a view source or view original message. Um, and here's a breakdown of all the hidden headers that you get that where it shows where our, the bounce domain setting, which is necessary for that SPF authentication. You got the DKIM signature there that shows that the message is authenticated and is truly from, in this case, marketing.salesforce.com and so forth. So those are just examples of when you have a domain name mapped onto Marketing Cloud with sender authentication package, there's all these different places and more that it's going to show up in the headers. <coughs> Um, sometimes clients ask, hey, can you just tell me what IP address to point this domain at so that you can set it up in Marketing Cloud? Or what's the C name record or what's the alias that I just point this at to um, set this up? Um, and it's important to make clear that it, it's not just that simple. Um, there are a whole bunch here. There's 20 odd, uh, about 20 DNS entries um, that go into place to support uh, domain mapping with sender authentication package. Right near the bottom, that 10 DKIM one, that's the that's the start of the domain keys, the DKIM public DNS key uh, that uh, that enables that DKIM authentication. Um, near the top there, where it's, there's a text record, it says V equals SPF one, right? That's the SPF authentication record. Then in between that, it's got all that different stuff for tracking clicks, uh, for for the view as a web page uh, link, for landing pages, for image hosting for uh, reply handling and so forth. So it's important to understand that there isn't just one server or one endpoint um, that you point everything at to map a domain to marketing cloud. There's all these different subsystems that all use different servers because the servers are dedicated to different purposes um, and for to keep uh, uh, things segregated so that there's more resources available to handle each specific part of them. Again, they're all different servers with different entries in DNS not just one single thing you point at. Uh, so a sender authentication package, right? You, you, either that comes with the addition you purchased or you purchase that separately. You fill out the form and, uh, and then we set up the domain name for you. Um, either we host the domain's DNS for you by way of domain subdomain delegation, um, which is a DNS setting that says, hey, for part of my domain name, like if I have antliverson.com, for email.aliverson.com, that subdomain, that little part of my domain, delegate out that DNS hosting or, or mapping for just the email part of it over to this third party, in this case, Salesforce. We host all that DNS for you. Or some companies can't support that. So in that instance, that's when we uh, will give the client the copy of the DNS record, all of those, those 20 DNS entries that I showed you in that prior slide, and say, here's the mapping that you need to copy and paste all this stuff into your DNS setup tool. Um, and then you go ahead and set that up and maps all that stuff there and you get all that benefit, right? You get everything branded as the client. You get everything uh, authenticated with email authentication. And, and importantly, you're not sort of showing yourself off to the world of Salesforce. Um, as much as we wish we would, customers of big brands don't always know who Salesforce is. 
And the whole point of the exercise, right, is to uh, brand as you, not brand as us. So here's some frequently asked questions for sender authentication package, right? Who should have who should have SAP? Anybody who wants appropriate branding. Um, there's a limitation there. Can you can in that you can only have one SAP domain per account. So your your core branding settings, which domain is going to brand across all of these different domain settings in your account, you can only have one of those, one choice for that. Um, you can add on additional private domains to have additional from addresses but keep in mind that core branding for like your click tracking domain for example there's only one setting for that per marketing cloud account can you share uh, sap's across accounts can you uh, have multiple ip addresses yes to both um you can you can add and share those around however you want you can sort of group ips and, and domains almost however you can think of talk i'll talk more about ip strategy here in a, a couple slides down um, do I have to use a dedicated IP address? I'm going to talk more about the strategy around IP addresses and, and when you use a dedicated IP and, and when you don't want to. Um, there are reasons, like if you send too little volume, you, you really can't support a dedicated IP, so you need to be unshared. That works with the sender authentication package just fine. It's, it's not a common configuration, so you might have to ask us after we set it up to change that setting, but that's easily done, no problem there. And again, I'll talk more about IP strategy here in a second. Private domain, remember I said on the last slide, hey, if you need to add additional from addresses and make sure they're authenticated properly, this is how you do it. Um, it used to be in the past that these were not compatible with that DMARC domain sort of policy specification where you would tell the world, hey, um, only allow mail from my domain through if it's authenticated properly as me. Um, we do now have support, full support for multiple domains in one account, um, and that's accomplished with a new feature called multi-bounce domain. So if you're if you're trying to service, uh, you know, be a mail engine for 40 different brands out of one account, so you've got 40 different rotating from addresses. You want all of those to authenticate properly. You'd set those all up as private domains. You'd work with us to enable that. Um, multi-bounce domain setting, we would turn that on. Um, and that, for those of you that know about SPF and DCAM, you know there's SPF works off of the return path domain. Um, and that's what this does is it makes a variable return path domain or bounce domain so that it always matches the from address. Um, and it's always gonna make sure that it sort of provides what's called SPF alignment, which is one of the necessary steps um, to make sure that you always pass DMARC checks as often as possible. So long story short there, it, what it does is it's, it gives an extra boost to deliverability by making sure that you can always pass DMARC so that you can turn on DMARC so that you can tell uh, people to reject mail that pretends to be from you but is really from bad guys. I'm sure there's a better way to explain that and uh, you ask 20 different people, they might explain it 20 different ways, but that's how I look at the short version of what we do with that and what that is. Um, frequently asked questions about private domain. I won't read this, everybody can see this just fine. Um, and of course, this will be in the handout as well. Um, a quick note on SSL certificates. Um, when you set up sender authentication package, we do strongly recommend that you also um, implement SSL along with that. What that does is it makes any links and images hosted uh, show up as HTTPS instead of HTTP. So in other words, uh, that any connection to a web server is encrypted and not unencrypted. Uh, the reason you want to do that is uh, a lot of big brands have a mandate to do this already, and they publish that in their domain with a setting called HSTS um, that requires SSL to always be on. Um, so you're going to need that in that instance. And at some point in the near future, um, possibly even by the end of the year, um, a, a future update of the Chrome web browser um, is also going to require it and might make some links unclickable or might make some images not display if they don't have um, HTTPS links. So that's why SSL is very important uh, and, and you really should consider it a best practice to implement it whenever you set up a sender authentication package domain. Um, SSLs, the important thing on this slide here is SSLs are domain based. So if you, when you, when you purchase some sender authentication package and you want to, want to include SSL, you need to buy two SSL certificates. Uh, one covers images and one, the other one covers everything else. Um, 
that's for images. Uh, we use uh, the Akamai content delivery network to uh, hash out image content uh, all around the internet. Um, and then we need that second one for everything else that's hosted by us and not hosted by Akamai. Um, but again, those are domain specific so that if you have one SAP and two SSLs, um, you can apply that domain and those SSLs to as many different accounts as you want. Any account where you want the, that, where the click domain is going to be that specified domain, and you want those links to all be HTTPS, that's your existing single center authentication package and the two SSLs you purchased when you set that up. Um, those, the, the three of those together can be mapped to as many different accounts as you want because so, they're domain based not account based so if you have the ssls that are that are set up for your domain they're going to work any place that your domain is set up in marketing cloud um, let's talk a little bit about domain strategy uh, get this question a lot um, uh, once upon a time i didn't really know if it was my place to tell people what what um what domain to pick and i, I still think there's a very strong um marketing uh, uh flavor to this question right it's really really a strategy concern um maybe more marketing than technology but i'll tell you where to start um and you want to make sure that if at all possible make sure it's some subdomain of your real domain your real brand um something like email or em or cp um, avoid salesforce avoid exact target um, again the point is to brand as you not not to brand as us um, in the middle there, you'll see, see I talk about the cousin domain problem. Um, cousin domains are domains that are sort of like yours, but could be registered by somebody else. Um, and you'll know that in email marketing, that was an, a, sort of an accepted practice for a, a good long while. Um, and that's not a great thing nowadays because um, a bad guy could register um, a, a cousin domain just as easily as a good guy. And so don't, in, in that instance, you're sort of leaving it up to the end consumer to have to decide should I trust this domain name or not? Um, you know, if, if a bad guy sets up a, do, a domain and it gets a bad reputation, one would hope it would be blocked, and, but there's still that, that leeway where they set it up, it doesn't have a bad reputation yet. Um, they could even be setting up email, authentica email authentic authentication on this lookalike domain. You don't want any of that. So you don't, it, really, if you make sure it's always under your real domain, you know, if you're BurgerKing.com, make sure it's always something under BurgerKing.com, like email.BurgerKing.com, marketing.BurgerKing.com, or so forth, just to make sure that it's it proves to people that it, it's from you. It doesn't. It, they don't have to trust that this is that that this really is still you when it's some other domain that you registered. And finally, there, um, stay away from generic choices. Um, those those are bad practice. Um, those we will reject those when we find those. Um, they they put us in a, in a in a bad spot and they put us in a little bit of a pickle in that when when there's a spam house issue or you want us to reach out to Yahoo or Microsoft, we need to be able to show them that you're a good good guy doing good things. Um, and ISPs are suspicious of generic email domains. Um, the domain should reflect the brand or the sender. Um, that's best practice. Um, you you own that domain, you own that brand. It's not a consumer's email service like Gmail. That domain name should reference you specifically. Um, and that can be tricky, right? If you have a, if you're, again, if you're servicing 40 or 50 brands out of one account, the, the old way of doing that where you just, you, you just don't, uh, you slap in a generic domain name and don't worry about it, doesn't work in 2020. Everything really does have to be branded properly. Um, there's some, it's, an, it's just an example of a, a legacy use case that that's sort of dried up and doesn't work anymore because of how ISPs and spam filters and security vendors have gotten so suspicious of bad actors and they they really want to see that domain name tied to the client's brand to the sender's brand. Here's an example. Actually, this was a real client example where I changed it to to show. Um, our demo domain instead because I don't want to name and shame a client, but I, I want to make it clear that all of this stuff shows up to people um, when they send when when uh, email messages are sent from our platform. So if you put Exact Target or Salesforce in there, that's going to show up, and that's wasted space. Um, it, again, it should be branded as you and not as us. As I mentioned, unbranded domains, generic domains, 
um, again, they don't they don't work. They're not good for um, a number of reasons, but primarily, <coughs> excuse me, because of vendor suspicion. Whoever need to advocate on your behalf. Um, there's ways to work around that. I I put in here. There's the auto dealership example, right? You could, <coughs> excuse me, you could still manage multiple brands under one domain if there's a, still an overarching brand that you can reference. But if not, uh, then you probably do need a separate domain name, separate private domain, at least, for each of those different brands. So that the from address is appropriately branded in the domain name. <coughs> Excuse me. When in doubt, choose a domain name under .com. Um, I would recommend against .org. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, uh, wacky political stuff going on with .org where um, somebody uh, just tried to purchase it and that was shot down, but the existing owner of it seems to have some sort of hair trigger over spam complaint issues um, and it's bitten clients a couple of times. So if you can avoid .org, um, it's something that we, we're working with the registrar to try to uh, address. But again, if you can, if you're if you're not a .org type of ent you know entity with, with a 501c or that sort of thing uh, as a nonprofit, stay away from it. Um, I, I also might avoid stuff like .photo, .Christmas. Um, they technically work fine, um, but we've seen a little bit of evidence that there are some ISPs that might struggle with support for them. Um, I also worry there's some history for some of these where um, spammers jumped on the, the, the top level domains like .info and .biz before other people did um, and sort of half wrecked them uh, before anybody else got a chance to use them legitimately. Um, so that's another reason that you might want to avoid stuff like info or biz or Christmas. And if you're not sure, again, stick with .com. There's a couple of limitations there too for things where we can't purchase them for you. That uh, doesn't mean you can't use them, but you have to purchase it yourself and uh, or, or own it already. And then we'll work with you to set up the DNS to make everything work just fine. Just we can't we can't be the uh, the purchaser in a couple of those instances. <clears throat> domain segmentation. Should you segment by domain for transactional versus marketing now? We get this a lot. In fact, this applies to IP addresses too. We'll touch more on that a couple slides down. Um, but the short answer is, should you segment? Yes, um, if you have enough volume to keep them both alive separately. Um, and vo volume on that ought to really be at least a couple hundred thousand messages per month for each of those mail streams. If it's less than that total, um, then you really should only be on a single IP address and combine those. Um, and here's a way you can add a private domain um, to handle transactional messages. And, and still have it be compatible with your existing SAP domain name. Uh, comes in handy, so it may, makes that up a little easier. It lets you segment those mail streams out um, so you have separate domain names. Um, domain name reputation for uh, ISPs is, it exists, it's a thing, but it's not as well developed as IP address based reputation. So to some degree, having separate domains is not important as having separate IP addresses, but the importance of domain reputation and then by extension domain segmentation grows, uh, it continues to grow over time. And so I was sort of a looking forward, looking to the future, um, domains are gonna matter more and more. And so they do matter a little bit today and they're gonna matter more and more in the future. So domain segmentation and keeping stuff separate, if you have enough volume to support it, it is a recommended best practice. Um, and one note here, uh, just make sure you don't just make up subdomain names, right? If, if we have an SAP, domain name set up for you is email.domain.com. That doesn't mean that transactional.email.domain.com is set up. There's no sort of inheritance or wildcard or anything like that. Every domain match for a from address and that sort of thing has to be an exact match. There's, there's no sort of wildcards. Sending as the top level domain. That's another thing that clients ask about quite a bit. <clears throat> Um, and that's doable and that's common. And the, the reason you might want to do that is because um, if you, you know, you're a private banker or you're a nonprofit or something where you want replies to be able to go back directly to a real person, um, here's the best way to do that. Um, set up the SAP domain with a subdomain. In this example here, I've got email.ntoretail.com. Um, then on top of that, set up private domain of ntoretail.com where that's your real domain name, your top level domain. Uh, it'll be custom DNS, 
we won't implement the MX, the mail handling record for uh, for that bit of DNS. We'll guide you. The, we put a note that says, hey, if this domain's already set up, don't implement these records here. You don't want them to conflict with what's already in use. Um, you set all this up though, and when it's set up properly, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to send mail as bob at ntoretail.com. Click tracking, for example, will be under email.retail.com. So if we'll click tracking links, it would be click.email.ntoretail.com. Um, and then, but if people reply, it's going to go straight to Bob. You can bypass the reply mail management, bypass that long dynamic address that gets generated, um, and go straight back to Bob. So while still authenticating properly, and everything works perfectly when you do that. There's some other technical ways you can do that um, where you could, you know, if you're really savvy with DNS technology, you could set up the sender authentication package and host the DNS um, and uh, work with your IT to, to manage that inbound email stream yourself, however you want. Um, so we can point it at you, but that, this is really sort of expert level stuff. Um, and a lot of clients that have tried this have struggled with this. And so I don't really recommend it. Again, if you really know what you're doing with DNS, I think that's great. You definitely can do this. We'll, we'll help you support it. Um, but barring that, what, what you really want to do is set up, as I mentioned here, you know, with your set, with your SAP, SAP domain and private domain mapped out like this so that you can send as Bob at ntlretail.com. Can you share domain names across accounts? Yes, works fine. They have to be in the same data center and stack. Now let's talk about IP address strategy. Hey, fellow moderators, can everybody hear me okay? I just wanna make sure I haven't been talking into the ether for 20 minutes. I can hear you, you sound great. All right. Thanks so much. Excellent. All right, um, clients ask all the time about IP address strategy and it can get pretty complicated, but I'm gonna to try to distill it down here into as easy um, to understand chunks as possible. 99.999% um, of our clients get a dedicated IP address, one or more specific dedicated IP addresses that are just for that client's use. They're not reused. Um, eventually, we'll, we will uh, recycle some old addresses that haven't been used for months or years, um, but that's kind of rare because turnover is actually not that high here. And um, so what, what that means is you're starting with an IP address that doesn't have a history at ISPs, doesn't have a sender reputation, doesn't have proof of being a good sender or sending good mail. Um, so that's, that's actually a good thing. You're going to build up uh, reputation through IP warming by starting out volume slow, building it up over time. I've got a guide for that, and we'll touch on that here in a second. Um, but that's important because that means that nobody else is using the IP address, so nobody other than you can have any negative impact on your sending reputation. When you're on a, a shared IP address, um, you could be affected by somebody else's sending. Uh, even if you're a good sender, even with our monitoring and best practices in place, monitoring is imperfect um, and it's difficult. And um, keep in mind scenarios like this, if you, if you come by and you send from your shared IP address at 3 p.m. today, um, and you get bounce messages back from Com Comcast saying you're blocked at Comcast. Um, was it you that caused it or was it somebody who sent it 2 p.m. who sent a whole bunch of bad mail to Comcast users and caused Comcast to sort of throw up that wall, put that wall up and make all that mail bounce, but it doesn't affect them because it's too late, that sun's already gone. It, what it does is it actually affects you because you're the next person using that, that shared IP address. Um, it, you know, there's a lot more people using the IP addresses of the shared IPs and a lot more going on. So that's a very simplistic view of it, but that in a nutshell is is really what, what happens there. Um, so dedicated IPs are better because you avoid all of that sort of problem. Um, dedicated means that it's dedicated only to you and that other people cannot cause you deliverability issues. The, the only caveat there is that you have to have enough volume to support a dedicated IP address. It, the volume actually varies. In fact, I, I could change the slide, and I probably will change the slide to say, you must send at least 100,000 messages per month. Um, if you send less than our recommended amount, we think that ISPs will be forever suspicious of your sending reputation, just because they don't see enough of a fingerprint. You know, they, They'll see enough mail from you to sort of generate a fingerprint of reputation 
uh, in their opinion. So that's why you need to send at least 100,000 messages a month. Uh, 250,000 or more would be great. Uh, the more you send, the better. Um, and also don't set up, make sure you're not asking for dozens of IP addresses where two will do. Um, that's another reason that ISPs filter people as well. Um, bad guys take that to extremes and it's called snowshoe spamming. Uh, and it's something you don't want to get tagged with because it's difficult to address when you're blocked for that. Um, as I said, you have to meet our minimum of at least 100,000 to 250,000 messages a month to maintain that good reputation. Or rather, <clears throat> to not get dinged with deliverability issues just because you have no reputation. Right? So it's not necessarily that you're good or bad. It's that you don't have enough visibility to the ISPs to show up for them to decide what to do about you. And ISPs get get so many connections from bad actors that they've never seen before. Uh, Microsoft used to tell me that they would get, you know, 80% of the connections they get from a new IP is trying to send them something bad. Malware, spyware, spam, uh, phishing, what have you. So they are inherently suspicious of mail from IP addresses that does not that do not have a sending reputation yet. Um, so for, from an IP strategy consideration, there's also an upper limit, right? We talked about that lower limit of around 100K to 250K a month. That upper limit is about 2 million messages a day. And that's a little hand wavy as well. You can certainly send more um, and that's fine. It'll work. But the further you go above 2 million messages per IP address per day, the more likely you are to, be, see, to, to run into delays and blocking just because of the large amount of mail you're sending. So if timely delivery of mail is important to you, stick to sending no more than 2 million messages per IP address per day. That's, that's about the, the, the plateau after which you're gonna to start to see delivery delays just due to the volume of mail. Uh, it's very easy for us to add additional IPs. We, we do that all the time. We have some clients that you know send 50 million messages a day and have the appropriate number of IP addresses to support that. It's no problem. Um, and uh, you know, along with that growing volume, keep in mind too um, that slow and steady wins the race as far as um, volumes ups and downs. So um, if you can avoid spiking volume, don't don't quadruple your volume from day to day. Um, for, or from week to week, right? Don't send 50,000 a day for three months and then try to send 10 million. That spike, that that drastic increase in volume is the kind of thing that'll make an ISP filter you. So um, that's another consideration. We have a different guide there that I can go into in more detail too if there's more questions around how do you get up to that, that high volume level if you need to do, for example, emergency notification. But keep in mind, this, the starting point there is you don't wanna go crazy from nothing. You don't wanna go from zero to 60 in, in six seconds, or that's a reason for ISPs to block you. Uh, finally here, um, keep in mind that our shared IP address pool is never an option. Um, the, we're not, there's other ESPs that have hundreds of shared IPs. I, I know one where their entire platform just runs on 115 shared IP addresses. That's not how our platform works. We have a small number of shared IP addresses in each data center. They're dedicated for use by small clients. They, they don't have excess volume to take up mail for big clients. Um, they, they are not meant for those clients. Um, we've had clients, unfortunately, uh, one time a, a number of clients tried to send large volumes through a shared pool and actually crashed that pool uh, and brought that infrastructure down uh, for a good 24 hours w until we were able to fully restore it. So that's how we keep that from happening again, is we keep um, large senders out of that shared pool because it doesn't have the capacity to support that. Just to recap, right? So there's how many IPs you need if um, if you're going based on volume considerations alone. The second half there is if you want to um, add some additional segmentation for a business need. Uh, and the reason you might want to do that is because perhaps you have a region or brand or country um, or partner or whatever um, part of your group that um, isn't so smart with deliverability or isn't so smart with list hygiene, um, if you want to keep them sort of separate so that they can't do damage to your good deliverability, uh, that's a reason you might want to separate them off to a separate IP address. So we, we have somebody who, who's a, 
a membership group and has um, has uh, subgroups in all 50 states. And so um, the way that works there is they don't want to have 50 IP addresses because that's too much, too many IP addresses. They don't have enough volume to support all those. But they didn't want to put everybody on one IP address and make it so that um, if some guy in some uh, little podunk uh, region does something stupid and causes blocking for everybody else. So what they did is they went to a sort of a tiered IP strategy. They went three IPs, red, yellow, green. The, the people with the best stats based on highest opens, lowest bounces, um, lowest complaints. Those people get the green IP. On the flip side of that, people with the worst reputation, highest bounces, uh, lowest opens, highest complaints. They went on the red IP. And then there's that yellow IP in the middle for people who are only halfway toward one or the other. So that's a way for them to sort of set up a tiered group of, of grouping based on sender reputation so that the red ones, we know they're always going to have deliverability issues. We keep them out of the way of the green ones so that the green ones who are doing everything right don't get punished by poor deliverability choices made by the people on the red IPs. Um, can you have more than one dedicated IP? Yes, we talked about what reasons why you'd want to do that. Can you bring your own IP address to Marketing Cloud? Uh, no, unfortunately, IPs are not transferable. They're not portable like cell phone numbers. And finally, no, we do not have pre-warmed IP addresses. Um, to do that, we would have to make other clients' mail suffer, um, be sort of perpetually stuck in the state of warming somebody else's IP before we gave it to them. Uh, we don't think that's fair, so we don't do that. Here are our reasons to segment, just following up on what I said there. I'm not going to read all this. I spoke to most of that on the prior slide. Yes, you can group IPs in almost any way you can think of. Um, if you have four business units, four accounts, you could have each one of them could have one IP. So there's four IPs total, one, one times one times one times one. Or if you want to group them so that two of them share two of the IPs and then one of uh, the other two have dedicated IPs, you can do that or all four of them could share one IP, or all four of them could share three IPs. Um, that's all doable, that works just fine. Um, and if you are uh, smart enough to notice that IP addresses have host names attached to them, and, and that's part of, part of what shows up under your domain name for sender authentication package, you'll notice that sometimes um, that domain name might not match if you, if you group IP addresses together, right? It might say, this example here, Maybe it says store.us, store-us.com, uh, but you're sending from email store.ca. Uh, does that affect deliverability? No, it does not. Look at Google, for example. Salesforce uses Google for corporate mail. So if I send you an email from my salesforce.com address, um, it actually comes from a, an IP address with a host name under google.com. So that's an example of we're using Google infrastructure to send Salesforce mail. You know, everything authenticates properly. It doesn't matter that the IP address is called google.com. So the, the net there is that for our clients, grouping IP addresses together, you don't necessarily have to worry about any sort of deliverability impact from any sort of mismatch with the IP address's hosting. Um, again, I can't stress this enough. Uh, the shared pool is not an option here for anybody except small clients. Um, and that is because we want to make the environment for small clients as good and clean as possible. Um, putting in big senders in the shared pool uh, upsets that apple cart. Uh, it's also important here that clients in the shared pool still do everything right, adhere to opt-in, best practices and permission and all of that good stuff that you should already know. Um, because those, again, if you do something wrong in a shared IP, uh, it'll affect other clients even with our best efforts around monitoring, even with us following up to remediate, there'll still be a period of time where other clients are affected. Um, so it, if I can't have a shared IP pool, what else can I do? Uh, again, if you have more than 100,000 to 200,000 messages a month, uh, you should be on dedicated IP. If the client has multiple business units and only some of them send enough volume for dedicated IP, that does not mean that the other ones get shared IPs. Um, if your entire contract has covers you, you send enough mail across your entire contract where it's more than 100,000 to 200,000 messages a month, then, then you condense all of your business units, all of your accounts onto that one or more IP address handling that volume. So if you have 
you know, if you have four brands and they send 40,000 messages a month each, that's 160,000 messages total. That's one dedicated IP address. Group them all together on that. And that way you don't get any sort of negative impact by issues caused by somebody else in the shared pool. So that's why we don't make exceptions for if you have a side brand or new brand or some other new account, new business unit under your account, we won't make exceptions to put that on a shared IP address. If your overall account structure, your overall contract has enough volume to support a dedicated IP, that is the way you should be configured. And that's to the client's benefit. This is all from the practical perspective of ensuring maximum deliverability success. This is not something where we say this to try to reserve something for our own use or to make life easier for us. Um, it doesn't actually, because it can be a bit of a frustrating conversation sometimes when people don't always understand what our, what our, our goals are here and that our, our goals are mutual in that we want the client to succeed and get as much mail successfully delivered as possible. Um, but there really is that practical consideration that shared IPs are meant for the tiniest people only. Um, and they're, they're not meant to bridge or backdoor or sideload or anything other than clients who overall do not have enough volume to keep a dedicated IP warm. Um, I talked a little bit about DMARC. We might run a little bit long here. I think if that's okay with folks, I am okay with that. Um, so, so stick around. We will try very hard to have time for questions at the end here. Uh, only a few more to go. Um, talked more about DMARC, about how you can uh, use it to protect your domain name against phishing and spoofing. Um, again, we have support for this in our platform now. Uh, we don't always turn it on by default. Uh, we, there's a default one for when we set up sender authentication package. We'll put in a simple DMARC record just for that subdomain. Uh, but if you want to get more complex than that, we can do it. You should set up a DMARC record. You should work with a partner like Agari um, to uh, implement DMARC strategy, monitor use of your domains. Um, and keep in mind, when you do implement DMARC, um, you're still going to see a few bounces here and there um, that reference failed authentication or failed DMARC. Um, and there's some edge cases where some ISP forwards mail, but they rewrite headers and they shouldn't. Um, that occasionally breaks stuff like DMARC. Uh, it's only, we're talking the onesie twosie level, not hundreds, not thousands. Um, but this happens and it's expected and it's not something that's sort of Salesforce specific. Um, when you set up a uh, sender authentication package, when email authentication is set up, DKIM is set up, DMARC is set up, it's very important that you're sending one the right from, from domain. Um, that is because that's going to affect your deliverability success. If your SAP domain is email.domain.com, but you send as bob at brand.com, those domains don't match. So you're not getting the authentication benefit that you're paying for from sender authentication package. That's very important. It means you're not going to uh, you're you're not going to get deliverability success overall. It's going to be diminished because that's not going to be it's not going to authenticate properly. It's not going to be it's not going to allow you to get complaints back from the Yahoo feedback loop. And if you use you know any free mail domain or any big brand domain that's locked down with a DMARC record, um, it's likely to bounce in in very very large numbers. Again, multiple brand support. Um, we talked a little bit about this. You can manage multiple domains out of one account. If you start to do that, please reach out to us via support and say, hey, I want to make sure we're setting up multi uh, bounce domain support properly or multi domain support properly. Just explain that you're trying to manage multiple domains out of one account and we'll help you make sure that that's configured correctly. Um, and finally here, uh, a lot of people ask this all the time, so I want to make sure we included this. Um, first stop for clients, support, uh, submit a support case. Um, second tier there is that deliverability operations team, my team. You can ask support to do to escalate directly up to us if you want. Uh, and we're happy to get involved. We're happy to get on a call and talk through issues. Um, we're, we're a bit like an urgent care. You sprain your ankle, you come to us, we wrap it up, we send you on your way. Uh, we do not handle ongoing engagements. We're not, we're not going to be a part of your weekly status calls. That's not what we do. Um, if you need that or if you need somebody to develop a plan for you, that's where services comes into play, that, that third uh, line there. 
Um, so that's available. Talk to your account exec and they can help map out uh, what have it cost to get you that dedicated resource to be your specialist to walk you through an issue. Um, if you're a partner and you're thinking, hey, how do I get support for my clients or how do I better understand how to handle this scenario? The first step there for you is the partner community. Um, that's you know the online portal where you're able to um, engage with other partners, learn from each other, ask, ask and answer questions, <clears throat> and otherwise access our vast resource, a uh, vast list of resources around partner training and enablement and so forth. Um, and then if you're stumped there, partners can go to their partner support manager um, and say hey I, I need help understanding this deliverability concept a little better can you um, connect us with deliverability ops al iverson's team yes we are happy to do that we've let the partner team know that that is an expected interaction so send those our way uh, and we'll be happy to meet with you as meet with partners and walk them through this and other deliverability related stuff. We also have a series of presentations for partners too, like on deliverability 101 um, and other deliverability concepts. Um, so ask your partner manager uh, more about that. If, if you um, work at a partner where it would be valuable for me to present an hour on deliverability overall, I'd be more than happy to come in and do that. So when you submit a support case, uh, support's gonna do that first look and, and collect all the details from you. Uh, they might run a few tests. They might ask you to send to our special test address called the reputation audit address so we can put together as much detail as possible. Um, then if they can't answer the issue, that's when they'll kick it up to my team at deliverability operations team. So I wanna make sure that that's stated because sometimes people ask, well, why did it go to support first? The support does that first line of, of pulling that information together before sending it up to us. Um, how to improve, improve deliverability? I'm sorry, this is a, a little bit tongue in cheek because I could, you could, somebody could write a whole book about how to improve deliverability. Somebody probably has, somebody even smarter than me. Uh, there are a million different things you could and should be doing to improve your deliverability. It's all gonna depend on uh, what the issues are, what, you're, what, what industry you're in, you know, a whole bunch of things around marketing strategy. Here are some good starting points, but there's a whole bunch here that, that I don't necessarily know or goes beyond what we can stuff into a, a webinar. Um, and that's where engaging with services or engaging with a partner um, is really your best bet to sort of map out what does your marketing program look like? What are the challenges of that marketing program? What problems am I having? And develop a plan to tackle those challenges. I think now would be a good time to open it to questions. Uh, I think uh, we, we've got some slides in here where we've answered some different facts that came in previously. Uh, I'm gonna leave these here and, we'll, we, and they'll be part of the handout, but I wanted to leave some time for people to be able to ask questions if they wanted to. I do have a few questions that came in. All right. All righty. So the first one is, how can we avoid ending up on the promotion section in Gmail? That is a common question, um, and it can be a little bit of a pain in the butt to uh, navigate. Um, <clears throat> so promotional tab placement is sort of a rolling black box where um, IS the ISP Gmail doesn't really tell you exactly why they chose to put it in there. Right? They tell you because they think it's promotional, but they don't tell you which measures they're looking at exactly as to what constitutes promotional. Um, and some people say, hey, I've reverse engineered that if you put this word here, or this in the subject line, that puts it in that tab. Um, if you figure that out, great, but don't hang your head on that because that changes over time. Um, and so I think it really boils down to, you either have to understand and be okay with being in the promotional tab, knowing that use of the tab is trending down and that people do check the ch chat tab and do actually interact with those messages. Um, and combine that with, um, if you really wanna sort of push your way back to the primary inbox, um, the only sort of uh, approved method to do that is to encourage users to recategorize your message. Um, so uh, in other words, tell people to move mail from the promotions tab back to the primary tab. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, people who you know, swear it's you change this line, you change that content, don't mention dollars or whatever. Um, and again, I'm not sure how true that is, but I did collect, um, a whole bunch of that information here and try to summarize it in that spam resource link there at the bottom. Um, so I don't exactly know if, you know, if there's any sort of secret sauce to, to keep from going to the 
promotional tab folder. You're probably not going to get it from me. But if there is somebody out there who's smart and, and knows what they're talking about, it's probably going to be one of those people that I summarized in that in that link there. Great, thank you. The just, next just question. Jump, sorry, just to jump in on oh, the yep. uh, promotions tab conversation. I think it exists for a reason. And if your messaging is promotional in nature, then it's not the wrong place to be. I think there's something to really think about the fact that Gmail offers additional technologies to make the most of being in the promotions tab with the micro data and the sort of script and JSON tools to make promotional banners and promotional messaging appear as part of your email in that promotional inbox. So there's definitely value in being there. You just need to optimize for it. Agreed. Thanks, Jason. All right, so our next question, is there a way to identify TLS is enabled in headers? Yes. Um... Uh, just actually view the headers and search for the letters TLS in all capitals. Um, if you find it inside of one of the received headers, it'll say TLS v 1.1 or something like that. Um, it, that'll that'll show up as one of the one of those little entries, right? When you look at a received header, it's got all these different little entries of different codes. And if there's TLS sort of standing there by itself, um, you know that you've got TLS. Um, and uh, by default, everything from Marketing Cloud should have TLS on today. Um, unless there's some error in configuration at some point. I haven't run into any errors in a very long time, which is good. Um, the reputation audit tool will also highlight TLS and tell you if it is found it as well. All right, um, along those lines, does Salesforce, Salesforce support wildcard SSL certificates? Uh, not today, um, I, I would say. Uh, I am aware that the SSL landscape has changed an awful lot over the past few years. Um, and I know there's been discussion about um, what, how we might want to improve uh, how we uh, account for and allow for SSL util utilization. Uh, but uh, I know there's discussions ongoing about that, but I, I don't know the state of them or how quickly something might change there. Um, wildcard search would be useful. Um, search from different vendors like Let's Encrypt would be useful. Uh, and I know we're not there today. Um, and I know also that I'm not the only one that's aware that that's something we need to look at for the future. So I know those discussions are happening. Unfortunately, they're not happening in front of me. And we've had quite a few questions come in asking about using a salesperson via sales cloud um, in your delivery address and how that will affect deliverability, um, both using the uh, parent or top level domain uh, when you have SAP for your subdomains and in general. Excellent questions here. I'm going to pull up a specific slide here. Sorry for the blinking. Come on, little computer. So um, it's common and, and, and should be expected. Um, and don't shy from it. Just make sure that the groundwork is laid so that all the emails authenticate properly. Um, if at all possible, map it out like this. The same stuff written a different way right here. Um, set up your SAP domain um, and then set up the private domain and make sure that the from addresses that are coming in to be sent uh, from the transfer from sales cloud, the addresses are coming in and you're sending as, you know, bob at ntoretail.com for marketing cloud. Just make sure that that's set up as a private, private domain properly um, so that it authenticates. Um, and that's something you can test um, by working with our support to ask for help to execute a reputation audit test. Um, or you can send to a Gmail account and do view message source to see the headers and see the breakdown and Gmail will have authentication results. You'll see whether or not SPF passes and you want to look for a DKIM pass as well. Um, and DMARC, actually, uh, Gmail will put that in a header as well. So that's key. It's totally fine to do it that way. Lots of people do it. Just make sure the domains are set up properly in Marketing Cloud so that you get the full benefit of email authentication. Great, thank you. We're going to take just a couple more questions, and then if we can't get to them, um, we'll either try and answer them within the community or uh, reply back to you, um, either via Gilda or Al. I know he shared his information as well. Um, and most of us are also available on LinkedIn, Twitter, or the communities to answer your questions as well as the VIPs and the marketing champions, and that's one of our favorite things to do. Um, so um, our next question. What are best practices around clients that don't want customers to email them back or want to use an unmonitored email address that doesn't exist? Um, believe it or not, that doesn't really harm deliverability. Um, so it's okay to do. Uh, a lot of people use a no reply address. 
there's guidance out there that says eh, it's a bad practice and you shouldn't do it. Um, but we have tons of clients doing it just fine. They don't have deliverability issues. Um, if you if you need to boost deliverability though, and, and you're sort of on the edge and always sort of perpetually running into deliverability problems, supposedly one way to sort of give yourself a minor deliverability boost is to encourage people to reply and and have that reply actually go somewhere. So if they it, like Gmail, for example, if they see that you actually interact with the sender of the message, um, they are more likely to put the message in the inbox than the spam folder. So you don't have to do it, and it's not it's by far from the only governing factor over whether or not you're going to get to the inbox. Uh, but again, on those edge cases where you're sort of struggling, if you can make it repliable and actually um, be able to interact with subscribers that way, it, it will um, provide at least a modest deliverability boost. All right, and then our final question uh, for today will be, what tools do you recommend to monitor your deliverability and your records? All right, so, uh, so uh, I'm gonna show a link to one of our guides here that's gonna cover that. Yep. And? Al has some of the best documentation. I've worked with him with a few different brands that I've worked at. So he's one of my favorite presenters because <laughs> he has the best documentation. I appreciate that. Thank you. So this marketing cloud deliverability 101 guide um, covers, you know, besides the, the the basic concepts of what is deliverability and reputation, it provides um, guides to what are free and paid and in-application deliverability monitors and, and, and alerts. How, you know, what are your options for both for what stats do I look at inside a marketing cloud? Uh, what tools can I add on like, like, a return path or bounce detective or reputation audit. And that also includes uh, a number of freebie tools like Mail Tester and Sender Score uh, that are excellent for exactly that kind of stuff. Mail, Mail Tester can help you check your authentication, tell you that, you know, and if that passes, you know, your DNS records are set up properly. Sender Score lets you look at the, the reputation of your IP address and, and gives you reasons why it's, um, it's imperfect if it's imperfect. Um, and so, that's the best place to look for that information. And again, you guys are going to get a PDF copy of this, so this will all be these links will all be clickable. He also has great information on feedback loops in there, and which ones that you can set up, and which ones are maintained by Marketing Cloud as well. Um, I use that one constantly um, because we're always acquiring new brands, so I'm, I'm always sending that out. All right, so that was our last question, and I want to thank everyone for attending today. We appreciate you being here, and we're going to send out the webinar recording and the slide deck, just like Alan said. And thanks again for joining us, and we will see you next time. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everyone.